Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend and we're doing a wonderful dish today. We're actually doing something that seems very modern, but actually works perfectly for 200 years ago. We're doing macaroni, or we might call it today, macaroni and cheese. Thanks for joining us today. Macaroni is a really interesting topic, especially in England in the 18th century. It shows up in like 1760s, 1770s, not for the pasta dish specifically, but for fashion, which sounds kind of strange. Uh, young gentlemen in the 18th century, they would take a continental trip, uh, English gentlemen, they'd take this continental trip, they would travel through Europe and they would go to Italy and they would get ideas for, uh, interesting ideas for fashion and for food and all kinds of things. They'd come back to England, they'd bring these ideas with them. And many times they wore sort of over the top extravagant clothing and they would call these guys macaroni or they would they would uh, say they were part of the macaroni club right and part of that is because they went to Italy and they enjoyed macaroni the dish the food but the reason why they were called macaroni was because of what they were wearing now the macaroni, the dish, the food doesn't really show up in English cooking or at least in the English cookbooks until a little bit later into the 18th century. You really start to see these show up into the cookbooks in the 1780s, 1790s. It gets much more popular. So the recipe we're doing today is from 1784. It's John Farley's London Art of Cookery and this one's just titled Macaroni. Let's get started. So the pasta we're working with today here is a small tube pasta. It's hard to guess exactly what their macaroni was like. There are some other recipes though that, that talk about uh, small pipe um, macaroni that you cut into pieces. So apparently it was rather long tubes. Uh, so today we're working with this which is about inch and a half small tube. Let's get this four ounces of pasta into our boiling water. So our macaroni has boiled up nice and tender and I've uh, put it in the sieve to dry it off well. And now it goes into a tossing pan or into a frying pan. Along with our macaroni goes a, uh, a jill of cream. So I've got a jill of heavy cream here. We're gonna pour that in. And, uh, and a jill is about a half a cup. And this is a, a ball of butter rolled in flour. That goes in here as well. And then onto the fire for about five minutes. After the five minutes, it comes off of the fire. And here we add a lot of Parmesan cheese. And as the, as the recipe says, toasted all over it. I'm coming in here with a salamander and toasting the top of this to brown it lightly. Wow, that looks so good. Well, again, this dish looks tremendous with that nice browned uh, cheese up on top. And I'm gonna add just a hair of uh, pepper to my, my uh, macaroni and cheese because that's the way I like it. Let's find out how this particular batch turned out. I really enjoy Parmesan cheese. It's one of those uh, cheeses that shows up many times in 18th century recipes. A few of the macaroni and cheese recipes that you see at the late 18th century, instead of Parmesan, they have uh, Cheshire cheese, which is a common one that you'll see in the cookbooks also. Uh, one of the things it talks about is that this cools off very rapidly and that you should serve it on a water plate. In the 18th century, they had these uh, plates that were sort of like double plates put together that you could pour hot water into the center of them to keep your dish nice and warm so that it could come to the table hot and it would stay hot. And that's one of the dishes, several of the recipes talk about that, that you wanna put it in a water plate to keep it warm. But tremendous flavors, a wonderful, fairly simple recipe to put together. And right out of the 18th century. So there you go, 18th century macaroni and cheese, great flavors, simple dish to do. 
Today we're going to be making a green sweet meat. We're going to be candying lime peel. I went back into the cookbooks uh, looking at candied peel or citrus peel recipes. There were many of them. Uh, they range from very, very complicated, like uh, Hannah Glass's recipe for uh, candied lime peel. It takes seven days of soaking, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the, the recipes are actually very simple. We'll be kind of meeting halfway in between with this recipe. Let's get started. Uh, before we start cutting up limes, let's talk about the lime just a little bit. These, uh, you want to pick the right lime. And I first started off with these sort of like extra large key limes to experiment with. Turns out that they have very little rind. Uh, they're just, if, if you peel, take the peel off of these, there's, there's no like pith there, which is actually what turns out to be what we're candying. Find a nice thick peeled lime. Something that looks a lot more like a lemon than a, one of those little tiny limes, right? So I've got a good big lime here. Cut it in half, uh, cut it in quarters, and then we can start to, uh, to get the peel off of it. You want to keep this white pith on there so we can kind of shave this excess off a little bit if we need to. I'm going to take the peels, I slice them into kind of thin slivers, and then we're going to pop them into this pipkin here, pour some water over them, and get them steeping. The directions call for switching the water out three times. So once these come up to boil for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so, pour the water off, start it boiling again. So we're trying to achieve two things while we simmer these in the water. We're trying to take away the bitterness and we're trying to make them very tender. So you can test these out with your fingernail when they uh, don't have that leather hard peel flavor anymore, peel uh, texture, and they've softened up, they're ready to go. So these guys are ready to come off the fire and we will just get those out of the pan. And now that these are nice and tender, ready to go, we can start the candying process. This one's really simple. It's a 50-50 mix between water, and I've got about eight ounces of water here, and sugar. So I've, let me get about eight ounces of sugar. That should be about right. Doesn't, doesn't have to be totally perfect. Let's get this on this fire and uh, dissolve the sugar. Then we'll put in the peel. We're gonna simmer these up in our sugar bath until they become transparent. And then they are basically done. We can take them off, put them on a little uh, bed of sugar and sprinkle sugar over the top. Then they need to dry. So there is our garnish. They look great. They'll make a beautiful garnish, a, a look on the plate. The question is, what do they taste like? We want these to taste good too. So let's find out exactly how our lime peel turned out. Wow, they still have, you know, after, you would think, after boiling in water for, you know, a long time to get rid of all that bitterness, and then boiling in the sugar, that there wouldn't be no lime flavor that came through. But these have a wonderful little lime flavor. I mean, I guess if you kind of connect this in a modern context, sort of like a little gummy bear, um, kind of, but a lime flavored, really, really good. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. We'll be doing an episode today that uses beets, but it's not exactly probably what you're thinking. We're going to be making pink pancakes. Thanks for joining us today. Now this recipe is from Hannah Glasses, The Art of Cookery. It isn't in the early edition that we published. This one's actually from the 1803 edition, but it's a great recipe and it's perfect time of year for it. So we're gonna do it. This one's really easy to get started. Uh, we just need one of these beets and it's really simple here. We're just gonna cut off the very top and the very bottom and we're just gonna boil this guy for about 45 minutes. I think our uh, beet has boiled long enough. We need to get the skin off of it. If it's cooked long enough, the skin will probably just pop right off. Mm. 
We'll just chop these up into a few uh, a bit smaller pieces and then they can go into our large bowl. Beat these up into a fine texture. Okay, so I think I got most of it. Uh, this is really, really hard to do to get this beet down into basically a beet puree, uh, doing it with the classic mortar and pestle, which is what calls for it in the recipe, can take a long time. It's very laborious. You in your modern kitchen will likely use something like a mixer um, or a, a blender maybe to get this into, uh, into its real fine consistency. But once we're there, it's time to start adding in our regular ingredients. So uh, I've got, she calls for four egg yolks, uh, whisked up. So I've got four egg yolks here, three spoonfuls of cream. And I'm not sure exactly where, where this spoonful is. So, you know, I'm just going to kind of guess a glass of brandy. And this isn't a big glass. This is one of these little glasses. Also calls for ground a nutmeg, probably quarter of a nutmeg. Now she calls for just two spoonfuls of flour. There's not a lot of flour here. So we're going to add two spoonfuls of flour. And I will add flour to this as I feel like we've gotten to the consistency. Now, we've got all these things in our bowl. Now the directions are to um, whip this for a half hour. So you see me back in a half hour. Uh, so as you get started whisking this, uh, it's time to taste it. She says sweeten to taste. And I suppose that, uh, you know, without any sugar here, there's, it doesn't have any sweetness. Uh, they don't have syrup to pour on these pancakes. So we do want them a little sweet. We don't want to go nuts with that. So you want to add a little bit of sugar as you're uh, whisking this together. Okay. We've whisked this for something like a half hour and kind of beat in um, a lot of air. And that's the point. That's the leavening for these pancakes. It's a real typical leavening for the late 18th century, early 19th century. We're not using anything like baking powder, or baking soda. We're whipping air into those eggs, into our mixture. That's what's going to leaven this. This batter is ready to go. We need to get it on uh, the fire and start cooking these up in a pan. Now, the, the real thing here is we want to have pink pancakes, not brown pancakes. Uh, we need to lightly butter this pan. So I've got a, a ball of butter inside of a linen rag here so that we can lightly butter this uh, pan to cook it in. And now let's, uh, we don't want it to be too hot. We've got our batter. We don't want it to sizzle because we'll have a brown pancake for sure. And we'll just get three going here. We're not going to make them too big because we don't, we want these to be easy to turn over. There we go. There are our beautiful pink pancakes. She talks about having these on the table, maybe as a side piece, not of course is the main thing, but this is to go into a large dinner where you have lots of fancy dishes and we have pink pancakes here. They've got their green garnish. This is all about the color. That's what these beets aren't here for the flavor. They're here for the color. They look great, but let's find out what they taste like. A lot of pancake there. Really, really interesting, especially with the sweet meat garnish. Um, we would be used, of course, to eating our pancake with a syrup or something else. This um, this doesn't have anything like that, but the garnish here or the sweet meat sets off these pancakes perfectly. And the really nice thing is, at least for me, is that the beets aren't a strong flavor component. They're down there. They're buried. Uh, that beet flavor. The beets are here to turn it pink, um, but they have a wonderful, great uh, pancake flavor. These are high-end pancakes with sugar in them, and they've got uh, brandy in it and nutmeg in it. So this is a fancy dish meant for a fancy dinner party. They look great. 
They taste great. This would make a wonderful addition. Of course, this time of year, they kind of fit well too. So this one turns out really, really good. And it's one of those kind of, you know, recipes that's uh, hidden inside of uh, Hannah Glass's cookbook. So it's a fun one that as you're digging through that cookbook, you find uh, little nuggets like this that we don't have in our modern repertoire. So the recipe today is from the uh, recipe book of Harriet Pickney Horry. Uh, this, she started her recipe book in 1770 and she continued to add to it uh, through the late 18th century and the very early 19th century. This is a very uniquely uh, North American recipe because it's an adaptation of a cornbread recipe. So if you take uh, one of the traditional cornbread recipes of the 18th century and you change it into rice, this is what you get. This is a rice recipe and it starts off very simply. Let's get a little bit of rice flour cooking right now. So we're gonna start off with uh, getting a little bit of water boiling here. I probably got, I don't know, two cups or so of uh, hot water going and then we're gonna start boiling that. And this recipe, the main ingredient here is rice flour. And that's pretty interesting. We don't see rice flour showing up in a lot of these recipes. Um, she actually calls for uh, rice to be pounded up and sifted, which is very similar to what they would have done with corn and cornmeal. Many times instead of grinding corn at a cornmeal, uh, they would uh, they would pound it up and sift it. So we've got pounded up and sifted, or in this case, just plain uh, rice flour from the store. We're gonna let our water get hot. We're gonna take a quarter of our full batch of rice flour. So the whole recipe will use one pound. We're using a quarter pound of uh, rice flour and we're gonna slowly introduce it here into this hot water and get it all boiling and make it into a sticky, sort of a hasty pudding of the time period. And I'm just gonna uh, add this a little bit at a time because I don't want it to clump up and uh, cause a lot of trouble. So we're just gonna keep adding this until this gets to a nice thick, um, let's say a, a gelatinous uh, goo. I'm not sure how to explain this so well, but we're just gonna keep cooking this up. And it actually, it goes really quickly. As soon as we get to a certain mm, critical mass, uh, this will thicken right up and um, get like a lot like a really thick oatmeal. Okay, it looks uh, plenty thick. I'm gonna go ahead and get this off the fire and we need to let it cool. So our rice mixture has cooled off. We need to bring this down to at least blood temperature. Uh, so let's say 100 degrees, 105 degrees. You can just stick your finger in there. If, you, if it feels hot at all, it's still too hot. But you don't want it to be cold necessarily. We're gonna put this into a mixing bowl. Uh, yours might be a little thicker than this. This is just slightly runnier than I usually do it. Um, now we need to mix a, we need to mix yeast into this because this is a yeast risen bread. I've got some uh, yeast back here, some barm actually, some ale barm. I recently was brewing a batch of, uh, of ale and so I've got some of this barm left over here and I've made sure it's kind of active and going. Um, you'll probably be using a, a regular bread yeast that you get at the store. You'll probably get one of those little packets, right? So put it into, let's say a cup of very slightly warm water. Uh, let that kind of percolate for 10 or 15 minutes, dissolve and do all its thing and start getting active. Uh, but since I've got this barm, I'm gonna go ahead and put it in here. Um, again, about a, a cup's worth. We're gonna get this mixed in to our current lump here. Okay, now that we've got that mixed in, I'm gonna go ahead and start adding this, uh, this other rice flour uh, back into the mix. So remember, we started off with a pound complete, and now we're adding, um, first we used a quarter of a pound to make that that's, uh, first uh, boiled mixture, and now we're taking the rest, this three quarters of a pound, and adding it in. I'm gonna go ahead and at this point too, add in a little bit of salt. This is gonna inhibit the, the yeast a little bit, um, but, but it kind of needs a little salt. The salt isn't necessarily in the recipe. And of course, we could add this, um, add whatever that is to the topping. This bread is meant to be kind of plain. Uh, it's a filler for other parts of the meal. 
Uh, so here's our mixture. Uh, I've got all that flour incorporated into that. And this is, um, this is a, probably a little, I mean, I've done several batches of this. This is a little softer than what I've done before, but I still think it's gonna turn out just, just fine. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is uh, prepare a bowl that we're gonna bake this in. Now you could bake this in a pie plate um, so that's kind of thin. It might be a little easier to get this baked up properly in that, but um, I've got here these tin bowls. They make a really nice loaf pan. And so let me get this buttered up and then we'll put our uh, dough right into this. So we do want to give this a little bit of room to grow, so I left just a little bit. Let me smooth this out on top because uh, we want to let this rise now. And to get it to rise, uh, we're going to let it be in a warmer spot. And to know when it's done rising, instead of like regular bread that's going to you know, raise up like two times or whatever and get huge, this is just going to raise a little bit. And the, the key, just like on uh, cornbreads, the key to this is to look for a little bit of cracking. When we see that ball open up a little bit and start to crack, we know, okay, it's risen enough. It's time it can go in the oven. So I'm going to set this aside in a nice warm place and watch for the cracking. It might take 45 minutes. It might take two hours. Depends all on the temperature and on your yeast and all that good stuff. So let me set this aside. We can see the cracking has appeared on the outside of this loaf. Depending on how soft it is or hard it is, you'll see more or less of that cracking. It's time for it to go into the oven. And I would say this is best to bake at say 400 degrees for I don't know, it really depends. 25, 35 minutes, depends on the temperature of your oven. I'm cooking this in the earthen oven, so it's gonna be a little bit hotter, probably about 450 when I start to bake this. Well, our finished product, our rice bread. And um, you can see here, we've got, we've got some decent structure out of something that has, even though it's called, you know, uh, gelatinous or gooey or whatever. It doesn't have any gluten in it. So um, this actually has a pretty normal kind of structure compared to something like uh, a cornbread that's made in exactly the same manner. And again, I, I this is a seemingly a exact um, adaption of a period cornbread to rice. So um, I'm, I'm gonna try this just like it is first. And really there's not much here, there's rice, there's water, there's a little bit of barm, there's a little bit of salt, that's it. It's as simple as can be. And it tastes like what you would expect it, very plain. This is a, the filling part of the meal. Well, we can add a little bit of butter to this. I think that's an obvious um, thing we could do. We could probably put all kinds of different uh, um, items on top of this as, a, as an additional flavor. We could heat this up. We could cut it in slices like this and fry it in the morning. I bet that would be really good. Such a unique recipe, using rice as a substitution for cornmeal to make this cornbread type product out of rice. Uh, very popular here. This cookbook was from South Carolina where rice was very, very popular. So you can see this is um, really, it is a unique one. There is one other rice bread recipe in that same cookbook. But this one was so quick, so simple. Uh, I loved it. And right out of the 18th century. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend. And with us today, we have a special guest, Michael Drigo. And uh, we'll, we're going to be doing a recipe. Which, which one is it today? It's called uh, Scotch Collop by Eliza Smith. Thanks for joining us today. So, Michael, tell us about Scotch Collops and this recipe in particular. Well, we just start out with the with the title, Scotch Collops. Collops right. from my past are, are slices of meat, mm -hmm. quarter inch to half inch thick. Um, but scotching, from my the re recipes I've done in the past, um, it means to coat or to cover, like a scotch egg. But in this time period, scotch can also mean scoring the meat. Hacking, scoring. In fact, in the recipe, there's the word hack. Yep. which I think is, she's referring to the, the scoring particularly. This recipe, right, comes from uh, Eliza Smith, Complete Housewife. 17, 
1730. 1730. Yeah. So, so it's is, early. This is a wonderful cookbook uh, that has tons, tons of recipes in it. This is one of the new ones that we are reprinting. If you're interested in this uh, cookbook, there'll be a link down in the description section. So how do we get started? What's our main ingredient here, obviously? Well, it's, it's um, they're using beef. It can be a young, it can be a veal, or it can be a, a more mature. I, I've got a, a piece of, of uh, beef here, uh -huh. and I've cut it into my, uh, into my collops already, and I'm just gonna scotch it. So what cut of meat are we using here? Uh, this is just a roast. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna scotch these up. Okay. But while I'm doing this, while I'm scotching this beef, if you want to mix up our, uh, start our dredge, it's okay. just some, uh, it's four egg yolks and okay. some melted butter. Okay, so into this mixture, we put in nutmeg, which the recipe calls for, yep. and a little bit of salt. It goes into the liquids here, not into what we would have gassed into the flour, but now what? Uh, we're just going to dredge the collops in the uh, egg mixture and then the flour, okay. and then we're going to fry them up. First, we put a little butter in the pan just to fry up our collops. And we're gonna get them about halfway to two thirds of the way through. Once this beef is uh, cooked to taste, to your preference, uh, we're gonna add a, uh, a good gravy, a rich gravy, and we're gonna add some mushrooms. This gravy consists of really whatever you want it to. It can be bones left over from a previous meal. It's carrots, celery. I've got some parsnips I've minced up. Uh, onion, it's it's whatever you wanted it to be. And once again, if you like your meat pink, you'd pull it out a little sooner. If you'd like it cooked through, you just leave it a little later. Well, All right. there we are. They, it looks fun, looks, smells great. Yep. Uh, now we're supposed to squeeze a little bit of orange over the top of yes. this. Yes. So we're gonna do that. Uh, there we go. What kind of oranges would they have had then? These Chinese oranges or? Right, so if you look in the cookbooks, they mentioned two different kinds of oranges, uh, China oranges and Seville oranges. Most of the time, they were probably referring to Seville oranges. Hmm. So it would have been a bitter orange, oh. likely, I'm guessing. She doesn't necessarily pick All right. Out, so. Can we get those today anywhere? Um, sometimes you can find them. Okay. They're not easy to find. So you ready? Uh, let's give this there a try. Mm. Oh, let's give this another try. What? That wasn't good. No, it's gonna be better. Yeah. So this is hmm. the egg was very thick. So we've got that kind of egg set around the outside of this. Kind of like a Swiss steak with the flour, but right. there's more depth of flavor here with the um with oh, this yeah. gravy. Well that gravy's killer. I mean anytime you do that, you're gonna make this you know wonderful. It's got some great oh, man. Uh, the mushroom flavor is in there, you know, all that gravy. Of course, you can taste that nutmeg, it just comes right out. So, do you think that they were scotching this to get it more tenderized yeah. or to get the flavor more in the well, meat? Well, probably both. But, I mean, and so that it so that it grips onto that breading as we put it on there. Got so, it. that really gives it a, a way to adhere to it. That's so, excellent. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, ex ex excellent, excellent recipe. Uh, Eliza Smith did a wonderful job. Yeah, Again, yes. though. Yes, she did. Uh, Scotch uh, collops show up so often in 18th century cookbooks. So uh, this is one of those just standard recipes that, that you should expect. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend and we'll be starting a short series on rice pudding. Today we'll be working on the rich version. Thanks for joining us. Rice puddings are very popular in the 18th century cookbooks, whether they're English or the cookbook we'll be using today. You'll find multiple recipes. So today we might open up a recipe book and we'll find what, one or maybe two uh, rice pudding recipes. But if you look in these old cookbooks, uh, they'll have three, four, or in the case of today's cookbook, Amelia Simmons' uh, little tiny American cookery cookbook, it's got six different versions of rice pudding in it. So I picked out one that was the sort of fanciest one and uh, later on we'll be doing the one that she calls a cheap one but today we'll be working on this rich version of a rice pudding let's get started let's talk about the rice number one this is rice pudding uh, we're using recipe number four in Amelia Simmons's cookbook and recipe number four starts off with boil in water a half a pound of ground 
rice. Now, if you're in the UK, this might ring a bell with you, ground rice. Here where we are, ground rice, you can say that, and we have no idea exactly what is meant by ground rice. Does that mean um, flour, like rice flour? Or does it mean sort of uh, partially ground? Um, or does it mean something different, even like polished rice? It could mean a lot of different things. Well, apparently in this context, uh, ground rice in this period and still is in the UK, sort of a partially ground rice. Um, granulated, I guess might be another word. Not pulverized, not turned into a flour, but sort of half ground. And here in the United States, the closest thing we've got to that is cream of rice that you can find in the grocery store. At least I can find it in my local grocery store. And this is sort of a, I don't know, rice ground up into say maybe a fifth of its normal size, but not into powder. That's what we're going to be using for this episode, or for this particular uh, recipe. So for the next step, we're going to take our ground rice and we're going to put it in, uh, we're going to actually boil it in milk. And we have to boil this really slowly. I've halved this recipe, so here I've got uh, four ounces of this ground rice. And in our uh, cooking vessel here, I've got one quart of milk. And I'll just take this in and I'm gonna take this over the fire and we're gonna heat it up and slowly cook it while stirring it so that it doesn't turn into one big clump. So let's get this on the fire. Our mixture is off the fire. It's really nice and thick at this point. You can see how thick it is. Um, it's got, uh, still got a lot of heat into it. One of the next ingredients here is butter. And since we want it to get mixed in nicely, we're gonna put the butter in while this is still warm, although we're gonna let it cool off. I've got three ounces of butter, and we'll put this in, get it mixed up. And I'm gonna set this aside for a few minutes to melt the butter and to cool off a little bit. So let's come back in a second. So our mixture's cooled off enough now that we can start to mix in our other ingredients. We can put in three eggs. These have been uh, whisked up nicely. Let's put in some salt, probably about a teaspoon or so. This recipe also calls for the expensive versions of the spices that would go in one of these. So we've got nutmeg, of course. This one, it, she calls for an entire small nutmeg to be put into that. This is a half recipe, so I don't need quite that much nutmeg, but, but uh, yep, we got some good nutmeg in there. Uh, some cinnamon, that's another one of these expensive spices that go in this. So we've got some cinnamon here. Most of the recipes call for some sort of sweetener. In this one, the sweetener is raisins. The recipe calls for a full pound. We're gonna put in a half pound because of the half recipe. Now for this fancy version of the rice pudding, we're doing something a little special. We've got a puff paste in a pie pan and we're gonna go ahead and just put our filling in here. We don't want to overfill it too much because it might grow out and cause us trouble. I think that's probably about enough. I could probably uh, do another little mini pie or a, a mini pudding with what's left over here. Okay, and since this is one that's a little fancier, let's go ahead and put some puff paste decoration up on top. So there it is, it's all decorated. It's time for it to go in the oven. Uh, you'll probably bake this at a typical 350 degrees. The recipe calls for two hours. This one might not take quite as long as that, but let's get it in the oven. We'll watch it and see just exactly how long it takes. Here is our fancy, our well-to-do rice pudding. Definitely has lots of different ingredients in it, the expensive ingredients, the puff paste, the everything else. Let's see what it tastes like. Well, this one is very 
thick and rich. Because the, the rice is a uh, finer grained here, it's much, uh, the consistency is very kind of thick throughout. So a very interesting texture and a good one. Uh, the, of course, I love it with the raisins in it. The raisins are perfect in here. And having that crust, that whole puff paste, really kind of sets it up another notch and makes it look very beautiful compared to other kinds of rice puddings that, you know, just kind of um, cook up in a pot. They don't look quite like this one does. This one's got a, a wonderful flavor. The kind of complexity of flavors and the raisins and the looks of it that it's definitely for a bit more of a well-to-do table than a standard rice pudding that might come. So uh, even then, even at this, it's not a very expensive dish. And obviously it's showing up in this um, American Cookery Cookbook uh, and it's not really filled with really expensive things. This is down-home cooking in this cookbook. This is just fancier version of that same thing. So a wonderful recipe, um, really still very easy to pull off, takes a couple little extra steps and has um, several more ingredients uh, than your typical uh, rice pudding, but still just a great recipe. Hey, we're here today with Dan Wolwack of uh, Cold Cracker Bushcraft. We're going to be talking about woodland cooking systems. Explain. Yeah, so we're going to make a variety of different cooking systems. When you're around camp and you have just that campfire going, rather than sticking a piece of meat on a stick and struggling with it or I do that. It, That's yep. <laughs> so rather than doing that, you can make different cook systems with what's around us here in the environment to really make cooking more pleasurable, make your food better. Right. Not only make rotisseries, but we can make tripods so we can make better stews and really control what we're doing because we need to think about the long hunters out there. They had very limited meat at certain times, so they didn't have the option of burning the meat or absolutely dropping it and losing it in the fire. So they had to be a little bit more particular. So if you make a nice cook system, you can not only feed yourself better, but you have multiple men, you could set up cook systems so everybody can do what they need to do around that campfire. So what do we need for getting this done? A variety of different branches out here. So we're gonna go pick some and then we'll okay. get started with the systems. So what kind of species and type of wood were we looking for here? So it depends on the cook system. Species doesn't matter too much as long as it's green wood. We don't want any type of dead wood for the simple fact it's gonna be exposed to heat at some point. So we right. don't want that actually catching on fire. So green wood's gonna be best. For the tripod, which I really feel is a quintessential camp tool, mm -hmm. because not only can we cook with it, but we can use it for a smoke system to smoke meat, but we can also use it for shelters, smoking hides, it's very important. So with something like this, we want long straight sticks about an inch in diameter Okay, is good enough. That's gonna be good and strong if it's green wood and about five to six foot in length is Perfect. most optimal. You can okay. make them shorter, but this longer length just yeah. seems to be a Gives little bit better. Gives you more options, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. So the process can be very simple or very complex. We're gonna take the middle of the road. We're gonna put a proper lashing on this. Okay. So if cordage was at a very minimum out in the field, you can just use one or two wraps and make it sort of work, but right. we'll put a good lashing on here. And then the way we're gonna lash is we can always remove that, cording, that cordage when we're done. Okay. So it's a very right. simple thing. So we thing. can reuse it, yeah. Yes, so first thing we wanna do is get the bottom of our sticks lined up. And again, right. I cut all of these very close to the same length. Okay. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the sticks where they lay very Flat, evenly. Right? Yep. And I'll take a piece of cordage that I have. Now how you start this can vary. There's no really proper way. So I'm just gonna put a loop on here that has a slip knot okay. and start to tighten this down. Now, anytime we wrap around the sticks this way is a lashing, right. and the wrappings inside are the frappings. Okay. So first we're gonna put a lashing. So we're gonna begin to just wrap this around these sticks. Mm -hmm. And just take your time with this and get it to lay in there properly. So we looking to bind these up really tight? Well, you can, it depends on what project. If this was a shelter, I would really wanna bind these up good and tight so right. it doesn't move. One option you could do to bind these up tight is take just an extra piece of stick that I gathered while right. I'm out there and use it as a toggle just to right. tighten that up. Now you see how that bunched up? We don't yeah. want that to happen. So we're gonna just open that back up a little bit and use our knee right here uh -huh. to keep that in line. And I'm just gonna tighten that down. So for every 
three lashings, one frapping is right. a good idea. Okay. So it doesn't have to be exact, but as long as we're close with that, I think it's gonna hold up just fine for us. So I'm done my lashings there. I will grab my toggle again, just to put a little bit of tension on that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm gonna begin my frappings. So I'm gonna go in between right. each of this and around. And this is really what's gonna bind up mm -hmm. and make this work more properly. Now you might have to play around with this a little bit to get it to yeah, fit work. between, yeah. Yep. And I'm just gonna continue, I'll put two frappings. Okay, Around, in between uh, each uh, one of those, In right? between each one of those. And really that'll be it then at this point. So we made our, la our lashings and our frappings. Now to finish this off, mm -hmm. you could do several different things. We're just going to put a half hitch in here just to hold something it. Simple, yeah. Just something simple to hold it in place and we will be set to go. So should we give okay. this a try now over yeah, the fire? Yeah, we'll see. All right, so very simple, just open it up. And you can feel it's a little bit tight now, but yeah. that will adjust over time right. as we loosen up on that. And this is our leftover? Now, yeah, so we always want to make sure that we have leftover cordage because mm -hmm. it's very simple. Then we take that toggle I was using to tighten down that right. lashing. And with just a very simple slip knot, okay. so I place that simple toggle on if you'd like to grab that pot. pot. Yeah. And then we just use that bale to hold our pot in place. Look at that. Now the beauty of this system is number one, we can make very fine adjustments by just sliding our tripod in. See, we've got right. some height. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to grab that leg and open that up. Right we sure. can even get lower. Mm -hmm. And then if we need other type of adjustment, we can also always wrap this over the top. Sure. And we can really get that high off of the fire. And that way, if we need to simmer something, it works really well. So you can see how well yeah. this works with something. Yeah, it's so simple and Very simple. so versatile. Yep. yep. So what have we got here? So we're gonna make a pot suspension system. And the beauty of this system is that you can put multiple pots on the campfire, you can make it as big as you would need. So if you have a right. real big long fire and multiple men at camp, everybody can use the fire equally. Uh -huh. So what we're gonna need to do is we need two uprights that are Y branches. Okay. Now these can vary in length. I like to say around three foot in length is best okay. with a Y on top. And then on the outside of your fire pit, you're gonna just push them straight down inside. So if you wanna right. give a little push down at that one, get them as level as we can. And then what we're gonna do is just take a straight branch that's long enough to go across both of them, okay. just like that. And you can level this system out as much as you would need to, right. but it looks pretty good right now. So you might be thinking, what actually are we gonna do yeah. with this? I mean, we just have a bar hanging there. Well, we make hanging system, hangers. So there's different types of hangers we can make. This hanger right here is just a Y branch. So it was growing up this way. We trimmed it here and I put a notch up top. Right. But we're actually gonna flip that to use it. So when we hang our pot, we use that notch and we can hang it this way over the fire. You could put multiple notches up on here and that will allow the pot different heights depending what you need. Sure. Then we can also take two Y branches if we have some extra twine or cordage with us mm -hmm. and tie them off. So I have one Y branch that was growing this way and another one that was growing this way, lash them together, hang right. that on here. Right. And, so and then can... you can hang your pot on there. Right. Also. So as you can see, we're a little close to the fire there, so making multiple hangers is gonna be most beneficial. And again, you could take this up as high as you'd want or as low as you want, depending right. on what you're actually doing. And we could hang other things on this other than the pots. We could probably, you could even hang a piece of meat on that if you needed yep, to. Yep, or, or if whatever. you took sliced meat and you skewered it through, you can hang it almost like a kebab and then just cut it as it cooks. Right. So what do we got here? Well, this is very similar, the setup to the last pot suspension system. So we still have the Y upright branches, but you right. can see that I lowered them a lot. Okay. And the reason I lowered them is we're actually gonna make a rotisserie. So if we have any type of meat source, we can actually rotisserie it over the fire. Now to do that, rather than just that single straight stick, yeah. I took another Y branch and then okay. I lashed a smaller branch onto that. And the reason okay. for that is if we put just a piece of meat on a round branch, it's gonna spin and we can't get that rotisserie effect. So this is gonna right. work as a clamp. Once we skewer our meat and tie it down, then the meat's not gonna go anywhere. We can lay this across the Y yep. branch just like this. And the reason this is a Y is because we can then use that to- Incrementally rotate it. Yes. Yeah. 
Yep, so we're gonna do that and we can just turn it around that way. Now, this morning I actually harvested a rabbit so we can put the rabbit right on the skewer and take a look at what it looks like. Okay. So I now have this lashed on and you can see as I rotate this, it's not sliding on the spit itself. Right. So we can set it right in place here like this. And then as we need to rotate that, we would just do so. So it works really well this way to just constantly keep rotating that and get a good, nice, even roast all around it. Well, we've got meat, we got the, the, the uh, cooking system. I suppose we should get a fire going and uh, cook this rabbit up. This reminds me so much of what's going on in Nicholas Cresswell's journal. They're traveling into the back country. They don't have very many provisions and many of the provisions they have with them get spoiled along the way. Um, they are eating off the land as they travel. You know, whatever game they can get a hold of, that's what they're cooking, they're eating in the most simplistic way possible. So the rabbit has been cooking now for about 25 to 30 minutes. And in the spirit of the long hunter, we're just gonna eat right off the stick here. So we'll cut ourselves a little section. I'm gonna cut some of this back strap off for us, right through here. Get you some meat right off that. Hey, it looks done, yeah. Yeah, I'll give it a little taste here. Smoked rabbit. Yeah, rotisserie style. Yeah. Really good. And if you were hungry and didn't eat for a couple days, it'd be really good. Yeah. And no gaminess at all on this thing. Nope. It's wonderful, um, basically chicken flavor, really. Yeah. In this episode, we'll be demonstrating a food preservation technique that is really meant to show historical methods, but is not meant to meet modern food safety standards. I'm here with Dan Wowak of Coal Cracker Bushcraft, and uh, we've been talking a little bit about, well, a lot about Nicholas Cresswell's journal. Nicholas Cresswell was a young Englishman. He was touring North America looking about what his future life was gonna be like. He's wondered if this was where he wanted to settle. And he, he had some adventures in the back country. And let me read this particular journal entry, and we're gonna to try to reproduce this. Uh, this is May 18th, 1775, and he's probably in what is now Kentucky. He says, all hands are employed in curing our buffalo meat, which is done in a peculiar manner. The meat is first cut from the bone in thin slices like beef steaks, then four sticks are stuck in the ground in a square form. Small sticks are laid on these forks to form a gridiron about three feet off the ground. The meat is laid on this and a slow fire put under it and it is turned until it is done. And then he says, this is called jerking the meat. That's what they referred to it during the time. Um, it answers very well, well where salt is not to be had and it will keep a long time if it is secured from the wet. So does this sound like a typical you know, like cooking method you would do? Yeah, so anytime you're gonna preserve meat, smoking's a great resource to do that, and you can use just about everything in the environment to help us get right. that and going. Right, he, and he describes a, a, exactly a, what a we method need to do. just like we've kind of done a little bit earlier. So we're gonna reproduce that. What do we need for this? So we're gonna get the four sticks that have Ys on the top, so uh -huh. four sticks, and then we'll get a bunch of straight sticks that are going to create that grill top in a sense. Right. And then once we lay that over, we're gonna take it one step further though, we'll put a tripod over it and then wrap it with some extra material that we have here. And that's gonna help trap the smoke in and allow it to cure a little bit quicker. So I got our buffalo meat that we uh, cut up earlier. If you're gonna do try this at home, make sure to try to get this cut uh, across the grain as much as possible. Uh, this is regular buffalo and we're just gonna lay it out on our, our gridiron here. Have a, there you go, have a piece here. Some of these pieces aren't beautiful, but uh, you know sometimes the buffalo fights you, so. Now we're smoking the meat, so we have the meat set on our rack that we built. What we're gonna do is take just an old scrap of cotton canvas, and we're gonna wrap it around this tripod. It's gonna help block that smoke. Right now we don't have a lot of smoke, but we have a good bed of embers, so we can feed that with dry wood. We don't want a lot of flame and heat, so we'll feed that with not only dry wood, but then green wood, because that green wood's gonna give a nice smoke, and we really want this to get super smoky in here and dry this meat out. So we'll just take this old canvas and wrap it carefully around this tripod to start to trap in all that 
smoke. When you're doing this, you always also want to be careful that none of this is down too low, that it's going to actually catch fire. So we can just fold that up the best we can. And that's going to help trap a lot of that smoke inside to okay. dry out that meat. So let's get that fire stoked up and we'll be good to go. A lot of the skills that I've learned were passed on from many different individuals over the years. If it was not people who directly spoke with me, it's from their writings and teachings that they have written in books and journals. I would like to pass a lot of this information on to my son so he has a better understanding of what it took for individuals to come to this new land and prosper and make lives for them and their own families. Here is our dried buffalo meat, kind of smoked and dried. And this is what they would have been doing on the, on the trail uh, to preserve their buffalo. And, you know, Cresswell talks about this completely, gives us this whole process. So we tried this out. It took longer than I expected. Uh, you know, we, we dried it for several hours and then we kind of basically had to let it go all night long before it really got nice and dry. And really what we're looking for is drying it, not cooking it. And you can see by these finished pieces, they're kind of black and they kind of crack open. They're, they're not real soft. If they're soft, they're going to rot. And he talks about how if you keep them dry, they're going to last a long time. Now, maybe for a long time for him was, you know, a couple of weeks or a month. But now the question is, what do we do with these? Now we can try eating these just like they are. Here you go, Dan. You, you give one. Okay. Get a try. Pick one out there. Um... In, it, in this state, you know, it's tough, it's dry. It's meat. Yeah, it's if meat. If you're hungry, it'd be great. Right. It's good, definitely, I mean, with the buffalo meat, you got a little different flavor yep. than, than beef. Nicely smoked, though. Really got good a little, smoke flavor. A nice little smoke flavor to it. They wouldn't necessarily just eat it like this. So they might use this, reconstitute it in a stew, you know, put it in the, in the boiling water, kind of let it you know, uh, uh, kind of reconstitute itself, expand a little bit. It's gonna probably make a really, really interesting stew. Mix it with some of your other ingredients because you don't wanna just be eating this on the trail all the time. You wanna mix it up, right? Yep, and I think too, we need to realize that they were eating to survive. Yeah. So many times now we think about eating for pleasure where they were eating because they needed to eat to live. So something like this is a pure survival food. A lot of protein, a little bit of fat in there. It's yeah. great to get you through and get you through the next meal. Yeah, on your it next gives time. you energy mm -hmm. and all that. Really, the kind of more fat, the better, really, in this yeah. kind of circumstance. Um, he, he even, you know, Cresswell talks about, he complains that these guys don't want to stick around to take the time to make these provisions, to dry this stuff out. But uh, if you have this dried, ready to go, when you're, you know, headed out to your uh, event, you can have this perfect. Uh, if you're doing something like Long Hunter, where they would have had this sort of provision with them. So what would you need? A little bit of this? A little bit of flour or cornmeal, and I think you really have a, yeah. a full setup of being right. able to go out and then hunt for the rest of your food, fish, and then have this as a backup. Right. Last week, we dried and smoked bison meat. This week, the simplest bison soup. Just like last week, uh, the ideas for this episode actually come from the Journal of Nicholas Cresswell, 1774 to 1777. And here's a little bit from his journal, Kentucky River, Saturday, June 10th, 1775. The people at the camp we lodged at last night gave us some smoked meat. On inspecting our flour, we found it does not amount to a whole to more than 15 pounds amongst five people. Must have no more bread 
but save our flour for soup. So this week we're gonna be using some of that same smoked and dried bison meat that we actually smoked up last week and it tasted so good. It's so wonderful for something that you can just put in your mouth and eat right away, but sometimes you want a real meal and so we're gonna take just a little bit of flour, just like Nicholas Cresswell had, just a little bit of flour um, that, that they decided that they would no longer go ahead and make the little bread cakes right there on the fire like they were before. That was a waste of the flour. They were gonna spread it out and they were gonna use it in soup. So we're gonna take a little bit of our bison here and a little bit of flour and make some soup. I wanna give this bison time to kind of steep and expand a little bit in my nice hot water. And instead of just throwing in these whole strips, I'm gonna cut these down into nice edible little pieces. So let's cut this up. So I'm cutting this at a diagonal. I want this uh, to definitely break apart as much as possible to make it a lot easier to eat and for that water to get all the way in there and make it into a nice soup. We're gonna let this meat sit in there and stew a while. We want that flavor to get all the way out and into our soup. While that's cooking, let's talk about flour. Flour was a, uh, a ration, uh, one of the provisions that they brought along with them on this journey. And it was of a great concern about what happens to this ration. We, they didn't bring enough and some of that gets damaged along the way. He writes in May 25th, 1775, on inspection, we find our flour much damaged. We're obliged to come to an allowance of a pint a man per day. Had we come to this resolution sooner, it would have been better great quarreling among the company and then later on the next day he writes our company still continues to be crabbed with one another and then i believe it will grow worse as the bread grows scarce and of course he does find that to be true the whole group of people uh, they get very upset with one another there are quarrels they uh, have fights and they break apart at different times and the ration continues to grow scarcer and scarcer. And then, of course, I read the earlier piece, which comes later on in the book, uh, where he says that they have to stop making that bread by the fire and they have to start using it just in their soup to make that ration spread out even farther. Our bison has stewed up here for quite a while. Uh, you know, longer is probably better in this kind of situation. It really takes quite a while for that boiling water to break down the meat and get it to be soft. This one's cooked up about 45 minutes or maybe it's been an hour or so, I'm not really sure. Uh, but it's starting to definitely soften up a little bit and uh, depends on how long, you know, you want to take this to cook. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let this cook quite, for quite a while. But now I can go ahead and add a little bit of my flour into this. I, you know, I'm only just gonna use a little bit of flour here just to thicken this up because obviously I've got a very small ration here and it has to last a long time. So I'm gonna put this in and stir it up so that it doesn't kind of uh, turn into little dumplings. It'll try to do that anyway and that's, you know, that's all right. But if it boils for a little while, it'll break up and get a little bit smoother. And uh, even Nick, Nicholas Cresswell, he did have at times something just a little bit more, just a little bit more flavorful. He talks about um, when they're drying the beef, if you've got salt with you, it makes it much more flavorful. And I just have this tiny little supply of mushroom powder, which is a lot like salt, but a lot more flavorful. And I'm just gonna put in a, just a smidgen of this mushroom powder. You know, he really talks about that, that people get really really bored with the same thing over and over again and it doesn't take much to make something really really special when you're on the trail well there's our soup it's thickened up nicely it's made of just water and the uh, the bison dried up and just a little bit of flour and of course the tiniest bit of flavoring uh, let's see what how it tastes that is extraordinarily good for as simple as this is we get this wonderful smoked you know bison flavor in there mm. that hint of mushroom powder. If you make mushroom ketchup, make sure to save the mushroom powder. It's one of the best parts 
very concentrated, wonderful flavors. So if you haven't uh, seen the episode where we dried this bison meat over the fire, make sure to look that one up. Such a wonderful episode. And it's really so very, very interesting uh, to look back into these journals, read about them, and then to actually live this out, right? Dry that bison meat exactly the way they dried it. And then eat these rations the same way they did uh, Really, you learn so much by actually doing history, living it out. Such wonderful uh, tastes, flavors right out of history. It's so much fun. Uh, this American uh, Frontier series has really been uh, a great series to work on. Uh, we've got more episodes coming up with Dan Wowak and episodes in the future, so make sure to stay tuned. I want to thank you for coming along today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. In this episode, we're going to be cooking a venison heart. Why are we using venison? Why are we using a heart? So venison would have been something that the frontiersmen would have been able to hunt. And we're using heart meat because while at camp, if we ran out of the good meat that we wanted, maybe the back straps and hindquarters, if we ate all of that and the weather became inclement or we were locked into a location that we couldn't move from, and game just wasn't available for us to hunt at that time or we had no luck while we were out there, we're still gonna wanna eat. So those organs are still a viable option and it's food until we can get something a little bit better. Right, there's some great stories in Nicholas Cresswell, some really interesting parts where they're hunting buffalo, they'll kill a buffalo and then a day later, two days later, they're out of food again. They're moving, they're eating the best parts of the animal and then they're probably leaving all the rest behind. But then later on, they're starving and boy, they'll eat anything they can get, even if it's a deer heart. So that's what we're gonna be cooking up today. We're using some of the, of the simplest utensils today, along with simple provisions that we would have along with us. Obviously we've got the deer heart, we've got a little bit of uh, fat here. It's actually a little bit of suet from the animal and um, the other, uh, common ration or, or uh, provision that we would have along with us is cornmeal. So we got a little bit of cornmeal. That's about it. All we need is a frying pan, just a few little utensils. So let's get this cooking up. We've got some slices of heart here, uh, nice and thin. This can cook up tough. So we wanna make sure to, to uh, slice it nice and thin. And we're just gonna bread it in a little bit of cornmeal, pop it in the frying pan. I've already got the suet going. So heart does show up in regular 18th century cooking, but not quite like this. This is so simple. Um, in 18th century recipe books, generally heart shows up. They talk about cooking the pluck of an animal. And the pluck is things like uh, the heart, the lungs, and some other components. You might have chitterlings, other parts of the offal of an animal, but they, they called it the pluck, which I think is a nice term for it. Mm -hmm. um, and they would use those in things like haggises and other cooking methods like that, where you would sort of hash it up and um, boil it in an animal's stomach or even in a pudding bag. So there are several different recipes that use pluck, but it doesn't show up a lot in that regular kind of fancy cooking in the cookbooks. Well, our, uh, our heart is off the fire. It looks like it's cooked through. It doesn't take very long with nice thin strips like that. Um, so what do you think? Is this ready? I think it looks good, but I think a little bit of nutmeg would set this off. Uh, you know, I just happen to have my, uh, my uh, little pocket spice kit here. It's basically full of nutmeg. There's a little bit of salt and pepper in there too, but we can try just a little bit of nutmeg to just set these off. There you go. I can't wait to try this. I'm worried that's gonna be way too tough. We're gonna find out. Hey, I can taste that nutmeg. Mm hmm. It's actually really good. It's not too tough. No, it's not, not tough at all. At all. <clears throat> the cornmeal and suet, I think, also give it a good taste. It yeah. just, rather than just grilled meat, it tastes a little bit more different than grilled meat. So. Right. Now, you could take these and, you know, kind of brown them up. You could put these in a stew, mm -hmm. you know, in this circumstance. In fact, Nicholas Cresswell talks about times when he's got just a little bit of flour and he doesn't want to waste them making bread. He wants to use them in a soup to kind of thicken it up. He would do the same thing, slice up the meat small, cook it a little bit, toss it in there, make a stew with water, a little bit of flour, kind of thicken it up. This, hey, it turned out 
really good for such a simple, quick way of cooking. Almost no ingredients whatsoever. We just need a little bit of frying pan, a couple little eating utensils that we would have yes. with us anyway as, as tools when we're out here in the woods. So, wow, you if you get a chance, try something simple like this. Dad, we have a parcel from Audley End House in England. A parcel? Uh, this is in response to that letter I sent to Lord Braybrook. Let's go see what's inside. Well, let's see what's in here. Here's the letter. Uh, May 1881, Audley End House. Essex, dear Mr. Townsend, I hope this letter finds you well and enjoying pleasant weather. Here in Essex, a little north of London, we have suffered heavy rain of late, but look forward to more delicate spring weather. I've been handed a letter from yourself by Lady Braybrook, who has asked that I send you a taste of England. That must be what this is. And in particular, dishes she enjoys here at Audley End House. I've tried my best to send you items that I have read are not commonly eaten or indeed cooked in America. Please find within a fruit cake, often called a plum cake. This cake is much loved by all in England, and the recipe I've used comes from a very special cook, Mr. Francatelli. That is the cook to Queen Victoria, and therefore could be used for any special occasions if probably or if properly decorated. Ah. I've enclosed some tea, as I believe we're famous for our tea drinking, and lately we have seen an explosion in India teas. Finally, I enclose a seed cake, a plain but popular cake. Uh, it's from an old recipe, and I believe in history they coated the caraway seeds in sugar. Today, it is often enjoyed with uh, fortified wine. And I've also included, for your reference, the recipes for each of these cakes. I hope you enjoy them. If you have a moment to send me a few lines to say that you've received the parcel in good order, I would be grateful. Yours respectfully, Mrs. Crocombe, uh, cook to Lady Braybrook. That is special. And look, there are the recipes. Wow! A package from Essex. What do you think? She said there was uh, a plum cake, a seed cake, and some tea. Obviously, this is the tea. Um, I suppose we should open these up and see what they're like. I'll cut this smaller one open. You open up that. Mm. Let's we'll see if they survived the trip. <laughs> this one is obviously the plum cake or the fruit cake. Looks like it survived the trip quite well. Very beautiful. And that one must be the seed cake. Yes. Look at that. That is beautiful. This smells really good. Let's open up the tea. It's loose and ready to go in. Yep. It smells it smells very nice. Mm, yes. All this looks and smells so wonderful. I'll cut into some cake, we'll make some tea, and we'll have a picnic down by the pond. Well, I guess we're gonna give these things a try. Obviously, we've got this beautiful, delicate spring weather they were talking about. Hopefully, in Essex, they've got this nice weather, too. I'll pour you a little bit of tea. We've got the, uh, the seed cake, and we've got the plum cake. Let's see how they turned out. So they've these have been traveling for quite a while over the ocean to us. Yep. Hmm. This one's very mm. good. You can taste all those fruits and nuts. 
I'll have to see, I'll have to check the recipe and find out what sort of nuts they used in this particular recipe. Mm. But you can imagine it, decorated, um, maybe uh, for um, Twelfth Night, it would frost this and have little little things put on it. Mm. It's really good. A very nice tea. Mm. Very good. Let's okay. see what happens with the seed cake. Now, this one, I'm not sure if it uh, traveled so well. But, uh, let me try out a bit. You want to try a little piece from mm -hmm. the outside? There you go. Let's try this. Hmm. You can taste that little caraway seed in there. Mm -hmm. Nice and sweet. Even the crust on the outer side is good. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's still really, really moist and good, especially after the long trip. The caraway seeds add something that I've never had before. That food was so wonderful. What do you think, Ivy? It was really good. We should send them something. We'll have to put together a letter and some items to send them. I really want to thank the folks at the Audley End uh, House. Everyone, this is so wonderful. Uh, Mrs. Crocom, thank you for this wonderful letter. And if you're interested in English heritage, if you're interested in uh, especially this Audley End House, this is uh, late 19th century, so like 100 years after the things we do, definitely you want to check out their YouTube channel. They've got some wonderful videos for Audley End House and other sites that English Heritage uh, takes care of. So make sure to check out their YouTube channel. Some beautiful videos. We've got this wonderful recipe today from the Universal Cook 1773. It's for a very interesting dish called a spring greens pie, and it's really good. Thanks for joining us today. So in the recipe book, uh, this one's actually titled an herb pie. And, but it starts off with spinaches and lettuces. And since it's springtime, it's time to go out and gather uh, different kinds of greens. This was a perfect opportunity for this time of year for us to do a little substitution. I do have some spinach in here, but I've also got stinging nettles. A, a wonderful green to put in a pie this time of year. Uh, you want to get these stinging nettles before they bloom or else they don't taste nearly as well. Get those nice tender tops and if you can get a brand new just out sprouted out of the ground stinging nettles even better and if you have if you find them difficult to find you might be able to find them at a local farmers market. I've also picked a little bit, I don't have very much growing around here, but uh, some ramps. Those will be a wonderful addition. We might, might not want too many ramps in here. Anyway, um, dandelion greens, another great green to put in here. Uh, there's a little bit of plantain. Uh, we've got some parsley from the, from the grocery store along with uh, spinach, lettuces. So any kind of spring greens that you have available to you, you can mix and match here. Uh, to your heart's delight and make a wonderful pie and you can that way you can change the flavors a little bit uh, This pie is going to be really easy to put together uh, First, I'm going to take our greens here and I'm going to wilt them in a little bit of butter uh, in the frying pan Let me get these wilted up real quick Now this pie is technically called an herb pie and it also has some sweet herbs in it. I got some sage, some rosemary. You could add some other sweet herbs if you'd like. Make sure to have plenty of greens for this. They're gonna wilt down as we cook them. So you'll, we're gonna fill up a decent sized pie. So have a good pile of greens. Another one of the ingredients in this uh, herb pie are force meat balls. And force meat is a bit like ground meat. Actually, in the 18th century, they pulverized it until it was a paste. And this is another opportunity for us to spice this up a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead in my force meat balls um, and add a little bit of nutmeg, maybe some mace, some, some black pepper um, into, these, into this. And this is um, half pork, half beef. Again, that's, you know, the force meat was this opportunity for you to kind of uh, 
take your hand in and change the spi the uh, taste of this by spicing it up. We could even put some herbs in our force meat if we'd like. And these should be rolled up into little balls. So I am gonna pre-brown these, sort of pre-cook them. Uh, because they're going in a pie, we're not sure exactly how much it's gonna get cooked. We wanna make sure they're at least cooked all the way through. I'm gonna go ahead and brown these in a little bit of suet. Now it's time to assemble our pie. Uh, I've got some, a couple of pie crusts here. We're gonna need a top and a bottom. And this is just a regular short paste. Uh, we do have an episode where we make short paste if you're interested in making your own pie. Well, let's put some greens in. And then we'll distribute our force meat around it. We've got our force meat balls. There we are. And you can put in as more or less depending on how you want your herb pie. Let's put in the very last of our herbs on top. And it also says to have a good store of butter up on top here. We can add just a touch of our um, nutmeg, uh, maybe some clove, some salt and pepper up on top of this. Probably don't need a, a lot. And now we want a top crust on this and I've got another crust here, but we want to prepare this top crust with a little hole in the top, put our top crust on. We will go ahead and, and put our little piece there, but we wanted to pre-cut that out. And now, of course, we're gonna do our outside crimping. There we go. This is ready to go into the earthen oven. If you're baking this in a modern kitchen, you'll wanna bake it at 350 degrees, probably about 30 to 35 minutes. Watch it, it's really gonna depend on how big your pie is. If you're baking this in an earthen oven about the same time, maybe a half hour or so, it depends on the temperature of your oven, make sure to swab the bottom and put this on a trivet so you don't burn the bottom of your pie. Make sure this oven isn't too hot. The last component of this pie is a leer, and it's made from three egg yolks and about the same amount of cream or milk. We're gonna whisk these together. Once the pie is basically done, we're gonna take it out of the oven, pry that little top off and pour this into the pie. Put the little cap back on and then set it back in the oven for maybe five or 10 minutes. It won't take that long and this will solidify. Well, we took the pie out of the oven after it's five or 10 minutes with the leer in there. It probably could have stayed a little bit longer to solidify that. It depends on how hot your pie is and what you really want here. That, that leer really um, keeps it nice and moist. So the pie is done though. It looks really good. It smells wonderful right out of the oven. I let it cool down enough so that I could slice it and it wouldn't just fall apart. So let's give this a try. And of course, we've got our, uh, our meatballs in here. We've got all these different kinds of greens mixed in, uh, some wonderful um, herbs. So let's see what it tastes like. Hmm. This is tremendous. There's so many different layers of those greens and their flavors in there. So, you know, maybe if you want um, some kind of flavors more than another. You can you can arrange those that green mixture, the different kinds of greens. Um, the stinging nettles are wonderful in here, and they're actually so very good for you. They can sound scary that they're stinging nettles, but they are very tasty. And you get these wonderful every once in a while. You get that um, that little force meat meatball in there uh, that kind of surprises you. If you really want to make this without it, you definitely could. There's there's so much here uh, flavor-wise that those aren't necessarily needed, but they're like a little surprise as you're as you're eating.
So the recipes we're doing today are probably actually more closely related to medicine, probably medicines of the 16th and 17th century, than they are to the idea of candy, but they turn into candy as time goes on. Uh, this, these are probably the very simplest of the candies. They hardly take any cooking at all. They're so simple to do and they're fun to do. You can do them with kids, it's great, uh, and play around with the flavors. So let me read to you this, uh, this first one. Um, we'll be doing two different kinds. This particular recipe is from Eliza Smith's cookbook from the, it's called The Complete Housewife. I think this is about 1734 or so. And you can tell it's actually related to a 17th century uh, recipe. This one says to make pastilles, take double refined sugar beaten and sifted as fine as flour, perfume it with musk and ambergris. That's the 17th century part. Uh, then have ready steeped some gum arabic in orange flower water and with that make sugar into a stiff paste drop into some of it two or three or four drops of oil of mint oil of cloves oil or oil of cinnamon or what oil you like and then it says let's uh, some only have the perfume so they're talking about the ambergris there then roll them into your hand like little pellets and squeeze them flat with a seal, then dry them in the sun. Actually, very, very simple if we kind of understand some of these. Have you ever heard of ambergris before, Ivy? No. So ambergris, you're probably, you might be familiar with ambergris, which is uh, sort of what happens when a whale gets an upset stomach and they, they, uh, they, they get rid of, they throw up ambergris and it ends up floating on the ocean and sometimes it'll actually wash up on the shore. It's whale vomit or something like that. And they actually used it in the 18th century. They still use it for perfumes, things like that. And this one also has, it mentions the idea of musk. Again, a perfume ingredient. Now these are 17th and 16th century things. They were really big into that idea of musks and ambergris and even this, uh, it says orange flower water. All those are perfume type ingredients. Today, we don't expect to have perfumey kind of smells come off of our food. In fact, that kind of makes us think of something like soap. Uh, when we smell them. So we're actually going to, well, number one, we're not going to get ambergris. This stuff costs something like $10,000 a pound. So I doubt you're going to get any ambergris. Uh, musk isn't so maybe easy to come by. You can get orange flower water. Um, and do I have, I don't think I've got any with me today. We're going to, we're not going to use those components because we want just a flavor of these. We want a simple one. Um, all we really need here is a little bit of water. Um, and some of these oils, flavorful oils, and uh, then some sugar. And we can turn this into these little pills or little seals. What kind of flavor do you think would be most interesting, Ivy? I thought that the mint sounded very interesting. Okay, so a mint, that one's easy. I don't know, There's, I like this one. It says, or what oil you like. What do you think? Oil of nutmeg. Yeah, oil of nutmeg. Guess what? I've got another recipe book that does have a recipe for making oil of nutmeg if we really wanted to try that maybe sometime in the future. All we need for this recipe is sugar, water, and our flavor oil. We're gonna start out by adding just a little bit. We need very little, unless you wanna make a giant batch of uh, water here. And so just about, I don't know, a teaspoon of water. Now this oil here, this flavored oil, it's just standard extract. This is mint extract here. We only need two or three drops of this oil. So make sure not to put in too much or you'll have way too much flavor. Now we're gonna start adding some sugar into it. And you'll be amazed how much sugar this takes. Uh, this sugar is actually just granulated sugar that's been powdered a little bit. It's not powdered sugar. We could use powdered sugar. It just takes a little bit longer. Go ahead and dump a whole bunch more in there. Yeah, there we go, oh, keep keep going, keep going. Okay, there we go. And it'll start to turn into a paste. Okay, so I think we're almost there. Uh, really, we want almost, it seems like, too much sugar and not enough water. When it's, we got a very crumbly mixture. We can see that, it's kind of very crumbly. Um, now it's now what we can do is take this and kind of knead it. So go ahead and grab a little bit of that. We want to kind of knead it together until it turns into a paste. Uh, one of the ingredients that we kind of 
got rid of that we might that might help us with that is gum arabic and gum arabic can be a little difficult to find you can order it online um i have tried some with gum arabic and it and it does help make a really hard uh pill but we can just do this with sugar also that's why i sort of took out some of the ingredients and you'll see in in our next um, recipe that we do after this one that that one doesn't actually call for any of those kind of ingredients um, we could also use as a substitute for that gum arabic a little bit of corn um, starch and that also helps stick together but you can see there we can make them into a little pill we can make them into a little flat lozenges like that we have a lot of options um, now what we're going to do let me go let me get a little uh tray so that we can dry these out now this next recipe is very related it's from a cookbook 20 years later this is hannah glass and her complete confectioner 1765 or so it's it's called something completely different but it's very very related this one's really simple it says to make pepper cake right take a quarter of an ounce of whole pepper and a half a gill of sack. Mix and boil them together a quarter of an hour, then take the pepper out and put in as much double refined sugar as will make it like a paste. Then drop it in what shape you please and on plates and let it dry. So what she's actually doing now, this is called pepper uh, cakes. It's actually little pepper pastilles, the same uh, kind of thing here. Now you can see she's gotten rid of the ambergris. She doesn't have the, the um, musk. She doesn't have the gum arabic. She's just relying on the sugar to basically make its own little cake. And the oil, remember that other one had like oil of nutmeg or oil of mint. She's basically making oil of pepper in this so it turns out to be a real interesting uh, recipe so all we have here are uh, three simple ingredients we've got our whole peppercorns uh, here in, uh, we couldn't use any kind of basically alcohol in this case even the oils that we were looking at earlier if you look at like mint extract it's actually got a bunch of alcohol in it we're going to cook all of that out because obviously it's going to boil or simmer for a quarter of an hour but we need to carry those flavors out so here we can basically use anything um, we could use a, a whiskey or a, a wine in the case of this one um, or even something like rum they carry their own flavors and i found that the sack really brings a strong wine flavor in that i thought was too strong so i'm using here uh, a rum instead and then, uh, then we have sugar just to make it up. So let's, now she says, put these whole peppercorns in. It doesn't bring enough flavor in. You really gotta crack these peppers so that it brings that pepper flavor out. So let me crack these peppers up. So I've got my cracked pepper here. We don't want it to grind it too finely because we wouldn't need to get the pepper back out. So that's gonna go into our little cooking vessel. Um, now we've got our our, uh, in this case, uh, rum, we're gonna put in, it's just a half a gill, so we only need a couple of ounces. And this gets cooked for um, a quarter of an hour or so. Now, this is the fast way to do it. If you're doing most of these other oils, you'll steep them in this for several days, maybe, and then you'll extract that, maybe heat, that, heat it up at that point to get all those flavors out. But in this one, we're gonna speed this up just like she does in the recipe, and just simmer this, kind of almost boil it for a quarter of an hour. So here's our mixture after a quarter of an hour of simmering, uh, just a half a gill, which is a quarter of a cup of um, our alcohol. It's almost all gone and almost in, just kind of turns into a sludge when you're done. Um, so you might have to add a little bit of water back in just to get enough liquid to do this. We only need a tiny bit, um, it, depending on how big a batch we're gonna make. Uh, but now we need to get the pepper, the hard pepper out of here. So I'm gonna go ahead, I've got my, uh, my strainer here and the bowl we're gonna make our final mix in. So I'm just gonna dump this in and just a little bit is gonna come out as a liquid. So basically we can just come in here and kind of smoosh it down get some of that liquid to fall through again we probably won't end up with more than i don't know teaspoonful so this is our speed version basically of oil of black pepper um we just have a little bit of liquid here so we're going to add just a go ahead and add a little bit of sugar to it just a little ham just put a little bit of handful in there 
Okay, so let's see how that mixes in. Let's see how that kind of holds together here. Might need to just kind of sit there and knead that up. These can be pretty powerful. You know, depending on how much you like pepper flavor, these can be kind of powerfully flavored, so uh, they can be rather small and still have a kick. Whoa. See, I told you. <laughs> the next step is to put these out in the sun to dry, or if you want to kind of speed these up and you're at home, you could put them in your oven at the very, very lowest temperature, you know, even under 200 degrees if you can get your oven to turn on like that and leave them for an hour or two. And though they should get nice and hard, especially after you take them back out and they cool off. So I'm gonna go ahead and set these out to dry and I'll bring back in some we've already done. Well, there are our finished uh, little candies and there's a couple different kinds here. We've got the peppermint uh, type that we made first off. Uh, these little guys uh, actually have gum arabic in them, so they're a little bit harder. And you can see that some of these we flattened out with a seal. So we used a, a letter sealing wax seal to flatten them out. So you could put a little design on them if you want to. Um, some of these are the, these are the little pepper candies. And um, I guess we're gonna have to try these out. Are you gonna, which one are you going to start off with? You're going to start off with the pepper one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, try try the, try one of those. Okay. There you go. Let's try the pepper one. Whoa. So the pepper ones sneak up on you. You're like, oh, this is uh, sweet and this is sugary. And then it kind of breaks down and you get a blast of pepper flavor. Yeah. And then it just keeps going. So you might want to have something to drink with, you know, some water or something to go along with your pepper flavor mint or pepper flavor candy. I think I'm gonna go straight to uh, one of these peppermint style ones, these, uh, these little guys. And there's a reason why they're small. You know, you don't want giant big candies. They're all sugar anyway, right? Those are definitely mint. Yeah, a nice mint flavor. And I mean, obviously, depending on what um, flavors you might be interested in, you can make these up any uh, particular way. So, I mean, some of these, it will work with just sugar and your flavor. You can add cornstarch or you can use um, powdered sugar. That might help a little bit in getting them to form up the right way. If you really want to try uh, gum arabic, uh, that will make them a little bit harder. You can. You know, these ones I use the gum airbrake with, they don't break nearly as easily. They still break, but not nearly as easily. Um, and remember, these are these are related to uh, pills of the 18th century, 17th century. The doctors would have made the same thing. Instead of the instead of the flavor, they would have put uh, medicine in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever they th thought might be medicine, I'm not sure if it would be yeah. good for you or not, but it was medicine nonetheless. Well, there it is, really, really simple. It's really fun to go back, dig back into the history books, uh, back into 18th century cookbooks and find out what candy and those kinds of things were really like. And it's a little tricky in some of these, you know, they're not called exactly what we expect them to be called. And they have this very interesting um, history that, that the idea of whole sugary things actually comes from medicine and turns into candy and things like that in the 18th century. So both of these cookbooks are available on our website, uh, The Complete Housewife and The Complete Confectioner. And I'll make sure to put a link down in the description section. What'd you think, Ivy? Did you have fun? Yeah. Yeah, I had fun. Of fun. We had fun. We made a bunch of different flavors and different kinds, experimenting to see how this worked out. And uh, I can't wait to try um, oil of nutmeg and make my own nutmeg candies. That'll be a lot of fun. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend. We'll be doing a, let's call it a misleading title, a rice soup right out of the 18th century. Thanks for joining us today. 
Today's recipe is out of The Universal Cook by John Townsend. This is 1773, I believe. Uh, John Townsend in the 18th century, he was the owner of the Greyhound Tavern and he created this cookbook, a lot of fun. Uh, this recipe is called a rice soup, but I don't think it's gonna turn out like a soup, at least when you read the recipe, it doesn't seem like that. But there's only one way to find out. With some of these recipes, we have to make them to figure out what they're actually gonna turn into. So let's get started on this one. In the recipe, he actually says, uh, if you're going to be using a pound of rice, you'll need two quarts of water. I'm using a half a pound of rice, so we need one quart of warm water. Um, I've got a rice and he calls for a cinnamon stick to be put in at the same time. And it's supposed to uh, uh, cover it and let it simmer until it's soft. So our rice has, is done, it's cooled off. I need to get the cinnamon stick uh, out of this. And now the recipe calls for adding nutmeg. It says great half a nutmeg. Of course, we, uh, we don't have a full recipe here. So we don't need a full quarter or a full half a nutmeg. That should be plenty. There we go. And it says sweeten to taste. Now this is light and fluffy-ish. Uh, rice at this point, but it's not anything close to a soup. Um, and soups we don't generally consider very sweet anyway, so I don't think this is actually going to turn out to be a soup at all. I'm going to go ahead and add some sort of muscovado sugar in here. I don't know what, I sweeten to taste. I don't know what it's supposed to taste like yet, so I'm just going to, there, there, that's what I'm going to call um, sweetened. Now, I just wanted to, uh, I don't want to break this, uh, this rice up too much, but I just want to get these things mixed in. I don't know why he called for them to be put in at this point, especially the nutmeg. I might have put that in a little bit sooner. Maybe it would have been overpowering if it was, you know, kind of cooked into it. Um, even the cinnamon we took out, so it, it lends that wonderful cinnamon flavor without, you know, putting it directly in there. Um, now we need a, um, this mix of egg yolks he calls for three egg yolks, so I cut this down to basically a full egg and an egg yolk um, because I, I still think it needs more liquid, right? So we're going to whisk up this egg and egg yolk. There we go. And we're going to add to it some wine. And he doesn't say what kind of wine. I'm guessing a sack. This is like a cooking sherry of the time period. Very, very popular. Um, so we're going to add some sack. Possibly, if we don't want it to be too much of a whiny flavor, um, we might use water here instead. You might want to use a sparkling grape juice, uh, depending on, on the flavor you want in this. But the, the traditional, the authentic flavor is a wine flavor. So that's what we're going to put in. Maybe a white wine would be a little less, you know, uh, intense. But that's all the liquid I've got to put in there. That's all I've got to make it into a soup. So I don't think it's gonna be a soup. I think it's like the uh, steaks fried in ale that weren't actually fried. So let's try this, let's add this into our mix. And we'll pour this in. There we are. And it really just kind of moistens it. And now this goes back over the fire and he says, uh, bring it to a boil or until it's the right consistency. Well, we've got some egg yolks in here. We wanna get this cooked up anyway. We're probably not going to bring in anything too like a boil, but let's get it heated up anyway. Okay, let's get this egg mixture cooked up. Obviously, we wanted to cool that rice off so that it didn't cook the eggs and make this into sort of scrambled eggs. And that's the one thing we are concerned with here. The recipe calls for it to be slowly heated and bring it up to a slow heat. So right now it's, uh, you know, it's almost liquidy enough. I'm afraid that, uh, that when it starts to actually get the heat, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get very uh, thick. So the recipe says to heat this until it gets to the proper thickness. Of course, we don't know what the proper thickness is. So my rule of thumb here is uh, get this to the point where, and I might have to cool this down a little bit, uh, get this to the point where the eggs I know are not raw. And then I'm going to call that good enough because it's already pretty thick, especially way too thick to be called uh, a soup. Well, there is our completed rice soup. 
Uh, again, as you can see, its consistency is nothing like a soup. Now, I'm not sure how much liquid you would have to add to this recipe to get to a soup consistency, at least what we would call a soup. Um, a lot, a lot more. And of course, it's, uh, it's sweet, it's not savory. So uh, it's certainly not what we generally would consider a soup, I suppose. Uh, so I'm just gonna say it is what it is. Now maybe 18th century rice was different enough that it didn't absorb all that water, but I don't believe so. I think it was almost exactly like uh, what I used for this particular recipe. So, but let's see what it tastes like. That's the important part, right? Hmm. Well, um, we have the, um, we have this uh, wonderful cinnamon and nutmeg flavoring in here and sweetness. Yeah, I'm, you know, if I wanted this to be a sweet thing, I might add more sugar to make it uh, sweet, sweet. But I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things, we'll have to let it grow on me. I'll have to try it out a couple of different times. He, I don't think he had any salt in this. This might, could, might use a little bit of salt to bring out some of these flavors. Oh. Hmm. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend, and today we're going back to 1730 to uh, Eliza Smith's cookbook, The Complete Housewife. We're doing one of the recipes that's called Carrot Puffs. Thanks for joining us today. So here at Townsend's, we've been working on a new project where we're bringing many of these old uh, 18th century cookbooks and some other books back into print so people can read them because it's many of these you can find online as a PDF version, but it's a, so much nicer to scroll through these books in a printed format. So we're printing these with a modern binding and uh, printed though as the original cookbook was. You can find this cookbook on our website. I'll put a link down in the description section. So today's carrot puff episode, let's get started. So this recipe starts off with carrots or parsnips. They need to be scraped and boiled. I've already got some carrots here that have been boiled and they need to go into uh, some kind of vessel that we can mash them up. We need to turn these into a fine pulp. So we're looking for about a pint of our finished pulp. And this looks about the right amount here. Next up, we need a crumb of a penny loaf. So uh, breadcrumbs in about, uh, a penny loaf is about a six ounce loaf of bread. They're little kind of bun things. Uh, so I've got some breadcrumbs here. It also says you could use some stale biscuit if you've got that, but we've got some breadcrumbs. We're gonna mix into that. There we go. Our uh, breadcrumbs are kind of mixed in there. Next up, we've got eggs. Now, the funny, this recipe, it's got a lot of actual measurements, but when it comes to eggs, it just says some eggs, but four whites. In other words, uh, eggs and then minus four of the whites. Ah, very weird. So I've got six eggs in here, six eggs, which, which two, two whole eggs and four egg yolks. I've whisked, whisked them up and in go the eggs. I love this recipe. We're gonna add some cream. We don't have, it just says a little cream. So there's, I don't know, a tablespoon of cream. Um, it calls for sack wine, which is a kind of a cooking sherry of the 18th century or a, a sherry of the 18th century that was used in a lot of cooking. Um, so we've got a little bit of sack. It doesn't call for very much. It does call for nutmeg, which is the only spice that's in this recipe. So I've got some ground nutmeg Gotta have it, right? It's an 18th century recipe. Um, and it calls for some orange flower water. Now, typically I would just not put orange flower water in a recipe like this because boy, it's just overwhelming perfume kind of uh, smell. But I just happen to have some orange flower water here in the kitchen, so I'm gonna add a little bit. It also calls to add sugar to taste, but I don't think this, I, I don't want to mix the savory and the sweet in this one. And I don't think it's intended to be necessarily sweet. So we're going to not put the sugar in because, you know, carrots have, um, carrots have a lot of sweetness that they carry in anyway. So there we go. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe sugar is what's going to need, what this is going to need, but we're going to try it without it and see what this goes. Because I, 
I actually haven't tried this one out yet. So we're gonna find out just how this turns out. Let's get this all mixed up. Well, we got our pan ready to go with hot oil. This is actually hot suet is what the recipe calls for. And it's hard to tell whether she wants to deep fat fry these or just pan fry these. I think it's deep frying. So we've actually just got a pan uh, with a lot of suet in it. I haven't gotten a big, you know, pot here. Now, obviously, caveat as usual, I've got hot oil cooking over an open flame. This is something you gotta be very, very careful with. Uh, you probably would do this on a, in a different setting where it isn't it quite as dangerous as this is. Uh, but l this oil is nice and hot. That's what it calls for. Have this oil hot and ready to go. And let's put in our, uh, our mixture by a spoonfuls. So obviously we need to sort of turn these over, making sure they cook to a nice light golden brown. If they're really thick though, they might not cook all the way to the internal inside. So you're gonna have to experiment with exactly how long they need to fry so that they cook all the way through. Well, there are our little carrot puffs. Uh, Eliza Smith's very interesting recipe. I'm still not sure whether I've got it figured out completely because this was really an experiment on this one. Um, let's find out what they taste like. They've got a nice little color here. I like broke this one in half. You can see it's like kind of like a little orange on the inside, darker on the outside. Really, really interesting little um, flavor to them. Uh, you know, I, I tried the first one out of the batter, a little bit of it, decided that it did need sugar, that this was intended to be a sweet dish, not a savory dish, because they don't really explain themselves in the cookbooks many times. You're not really sure what it's supposed to end up like. So I went ahead and added some more sugar to the batter and fried these guys up. It certainly was a challenge getting them to fry up. Um, possibly maybe some more breadcrumbs would help them hold together a little bit better. Still very, very interesting. And um, a, a fun little flavor. These carrots uh, bring some nice color and they bring their own sweetness along and you get some of that carrot flavor and then the rest of it is like a puff. It's meant to be sort of a dessert-like. So very, very uh, interesting. Something I certainly haven't seen uh, before. So a fun, fun experimental dish and maybe one that I would continue to tweak and see if I could, you know, what it kind of turns into. Not sure exactly what she was intended, but a great recipe nonetheless. Hi, I'm John Townsend. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. We've got a special guest today, Michael Dragoo. He's back again for yes. a couple of episodes, and today we're doing, what are we doing? We are going to fricassee a pig. R fricassee a pig. This one sounds really good. Thanks for joining us today. So, Michael, tell us a little bit more about this particular recipe. Oh, sure. This is, they're right around the 1750s, 40s. We start to see um, precursors to... Um, what we would refer to as Virginia or North Carolina barbecue, okay. uh, where it's a, a vinegar based or there's always vinegar in it. It's got mm -hmm. that kind of tangy. It's not a mustard. It's not a sugary thing. It's, uh, and this is one of those recipes. This thing is from 1730. Right. This particular recipe comes out of uh, The Complete Housewife, 1730, uh, Eliza Smith. This is an English cookbook uh, right from the time period. And it's, it's really one of my go-to cookbooks. Really enjoy this one. We are offering this cookbook now. It's available. You can find it down in the description section of this video if you're interested in getting a copy. So how do we get started on this recipe? What do we need? Uh, she has roasted a whole hog. I've used a, a, a shoulder, a front shoulder, a, a Boston butt, and um, boneless in my case. A bone would add a little more flavor. It's just a low and slow recipe, just like today. And low, very generally, is 190 degrees to 225. Mm -hmm. And slow is about an hour, hour and a half per pound. Okay. So no matter where you are in the country, that's about it. Your internal temperature needs to get to 165, however you're doing it. So in a so, modern kitchen, you might do this in a slow cooker? Easily. You could do it in wow. a slow cooker. You could smoke it part of the time and then bring it in. You could put it in the oven just Maybe. as long as you get the thing. 
Maybe in a Dutch oven or something like you, that? Absolutely. So, Just keep checking on it and keep basting right, it. And, yep. right. and in the time period, this would have been roasted probably over an open fire. Maybe. Yes. As a matter of fact, she tells us to take the outer layer off, the skin and all right. off, because in this case, what we're doing, you don't want that hard crispy. So we have this partially cooked meat. Yep. Now what do we do? We're going to take it over to the skillet and start introducing some new ingredients. To okay. So once we've got the meat in here, what comes next? Uh, we're going to add some uh, chicken broth. It just says a, um, a strong broth. We're going to put some white wine in and a little vinegar, just a little vinegar. We're going to add an onion that I've uh, stuck a bunch of cloves in. And now just a little bit of lemon peel. We're going to add some salt and a little mace. And we're just going to let that, that simmer for a little bit. So maybe 10 minutes? I would say 10 to 20. And then we've got a bundle of sweet herbs. So what did you put in for the sweet herbs? Uh, sage, uh, rosemary, thyme, and uh, some basil. Good. We've just got a couple more ingredients to add. Uh, we've uh, beat, beaten an egg yolk in with some cream, and I'm adding that now. Then we're going to add some mushrooms that have just coarsely chopped. So that's going to thicken this and make it kind of creamy? Yes. Alrighty, to fricassee a pig. Okay, I will admit that this does not <laughs> look beautiful. I think it looks great. Would this go over it? Did she talk about exactly how this was served or what it goes over? Nope. No. I'm eating. Okay. Oh. Woo! I'm eating more. Mmm. Wow. The vinegar That's just good. brings up. Yeah, you don't brings it right up. You don't want to go nuts with that. And it's nice and uh, nice and creamy. Mm. Wonderful. Um, nice little bit of saltiness yeah. there. People are always asking what the measurements would be, and, and this has no measurements whatsoever. It really depends on what you're working with, so. Right. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend, and today we're doing something a little bit different, fried tripe. And if you don't know what that is, you'll find out in just a moment. Thanks for joining us. This recipe is, again, from the Universal Cook or the Ladies Complete Assistant by John Townsend, probably one of my deep ancestors hundreds of years ago. Anyway, he wrote this cookbook in 1773. He was the owner of the uh, Greyhound Tavern. Yeah, so uh, he had a lot of experience cooking for folks. And this one is a recipe that's called Fried Tripe. And tripe is a cow stomach. It could be other animals, but generally cow stomach is what we're going to be using uh, here. This is white tripe. It's already been cleaned. Um, I'm not sure which one of the stomachs. I think this is from the first stomach in the cow. There's different kinds of tripe, depending on a cow has like seven stomachs. So there's multiple different kinds of tripe that people eat. Um, it's not popular in today's United States, but it was popular in England in the 18th century and, and probably in 18th century North America as well. So this one starts out very simply. Our first step is to take our tripe. Now this tripe is already sort of sliced up, but he calls for it to be cut up into thin slices, three or four fingers long. So just a couple inches long. Now it's time to bread this. And I've got some breadcrumbs here. I've got some um, egg yolk mixed up and I'm gonna go ahead and add some spices. He doesn't necessarily talk about adding spices directly to his breadcrumbs, but it's that's where I would add them. Uh, maybe a little nutmeg, maybe a little salt and pepper, uh, whatever strikes your fancy, fancy can go in there. And we'll start off with our, uh, our uh, tripe pieces. I've got three egg yolks in here. There's nothing uh, magic here. We just want to get them totally coated with our uh, breadcrumbs. Okay, these are all breaded up. Now I'm going to get a frying pan going with some uh, suet. Let's fry these up. It looks like we're good and hot, and I think we're ready to fry. It's smoking just a little bit. Let's see what one piece. There we go. Yep. 
get some in the pan. And the directions say to fry these up until they're a nice golden brown and then set them off to, uh, to dry off on a plate. Our fried tripe is ready to try. Now, he actually calls for a couple of dipping sauces. Doesn't that sound interesting? Dipping sauces in the 18th century. He says um, a plain melted butter for one, and then he says there's an, you should have another sauce at the table, which is melted butter mixed with mustard. And so I've got a melted butter mixed with mustard. If you want to try out an 18th century style mustard, the Grey Poupon mustard is actually probably pretty close to an 18th century style mustard. So got those guys mixed up. And I'm gonna go ahead and try one little piece here without any of the sauces because that's cheating, right? Little chewy. What would I, what I would expect out of tripe, um, but it tastes good. Of course it's fried and it's got breading, so how can we go wrong? Um, let's try it with a little bit of butter. Of course, you know, we already fried it, so the best thing to do would be to add butter to that, right? That's good. Now, hmm. Let's see what happens with our um, mustard sauce. Never been a big fan of mustard myself, but maybe this is the best way. Hmm. Interesting mustard flavor, but not overpowering at all, which has always been my problem with mustard. Melted butter is actually a real good way to kind of balance that out. So I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, that turned out really good. You know, I was really worried about uh, tripe, you know, being difficult. Now, obviously it's kind of chewy. So he had us cut them into very small slivers. Uh, so that it was more easy to uh, get these cooked up well. And um, wow, turn, turned out really good. I'm not sure if I'm gonna eat fried tripe every day, but uh, certainly for, and you can imagine, can't you? Greyhound Tavern, right? And you're eating in there 1775 or even before that because all these recipes are pre-1773. And somebody, um, they, they want something fried up they, they order up fried tripe and this is what they've got, would have, have gotten, and these two little sauces. So uh, really, really a fun recipe and fun to try. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend and we're dipping back into 1787 and we're doing a, a fun recipe called an asparagus omelet. Thanks for joining us today. So this recipe is from the London Art of Cookery by John Farley. This is 1787. And um, let, let me read this. This is a nice short recipe. I'll read this one to you. It's called um, an omelet of asparagus. Beat up six eggs with cream. Boil some of the largest and finest asparagus. And when boiled, cut off all the greens into small pieces. Mix them with eggs. Put in some salt, uh, put in some pepper and salt. Make a slice of butter hot in the pan, put them in, serve them up hot on buttered toast. Uh, I found this one kind of interesting. Uh, this recipe is in the, the made dishes part of this cookbook where they, you'll find recipes that are kind of like this, made up things, eggs. Um, right before the omelet section, there's the macaroni. Uh, a few months ago, we did the macaroni and cheese episode. There's a Salomon Gundy here. In fact, there's a lot of um, recipes in this section that are obviously foreign influenced. And uh, this omelet one is probably a French influence. And right here at the latter part of the 18th century, uh, English cooking, especially this higher end English cooking, definitely influenced by these uh, continental cooking things that are coming over from France and from Italy. So it's this very simple recipe with only a very few ingredients, really. We've got some eggs here. I've got a half a dozen eggs. I've got a little bit of butter. 
uh, that we're going to end up cooking them in. We've got our asparagus, of course, and I've just got a nice uh, big bundle of asparagus. That really is up to you about how much you want to put in here. We've got a little bit of salt and pepper. I've got about a cup of cream. Uh, I'll kind of judge that as I put them into the eggs. And of course, we're going to serve this up on toast, so I've got some bread sliced up. And yeah, no, unfortunately, uh, there is no nutmeg in this particular recipe. Let's get started. The first thing we need are our eggs. We need a half a dozen eggs. If you want to go with more of an 18th century equivalent, you might want to use medium sized eggs. I'm going to use regular large eggs here. Let's get these into a bowl, whisk them up along with about a half a cup of cream. He doesn't say how much cream to use, so I'm just kind of playing it by ear here. We're going to pour in our cream. Next comes the asparagus. Now the asparagus, um, he says to boil it. Uh, a more modern interpretation might be to just steam our asparagus. We don't want to lose all those nutrients. Or you, know, you can just lightly boil them. That's going to work too. Um, and now cut them up into nice small pieces. Now he's he refers to the green part. Maybe he's just talking about the very, very tips or the very heads of these. I'm going to go ahead and do about the top half, the nice tender part of the asparagus. That's what we're going to be using in here. And this is obviously already boiled. I'm going to chop these up, add them right into our mix, along with a little bit of salt and pepper. Now it's time to get the pan ready on the fire. Okay, our butter looks good. It's not too hot, uh, but it's nice and melted. And we've got our mixture here of eggs and asparagus, and in they go. So this recipe isn't maybe all that it seems, uh, or there's a little bit more to it. Let's say that. there's. Uh, in, one or two recipes back, there's another omelet recipe, and the directions are pretty interesting. It says fry it up till it's brown on the bottom, but don't turn it. And put it on the dish, and then brown it over the top with a salamander. So they, they kind of want to cook it all from the bottom side, and just a little bit on the top to take off the rawness. I'm going to experiment with this one and uh, very gently kind of slow cook it. So instead of flipping it over, uh, I think I will go ahead and flip it over, but I, I want to very slow cook this like you would scrambled eggs. We don't want to overcook this. We don't want to brown it on the bottom, really. At least that's not how I want it. So I'm going to let this cook rather slowly and kind of watch it cook all the way up to the top. We're going to see how it goes. So I put our omelet pieces on the toasts and they're ready to eat. They look good. And of course they, they uh, smell wonderful. Now you probably like, hey John, this didn't have nutmeg in it. Well, it turns out if you go back that page and you look at the other omelet recipe, it did have nutmeg and mace. So it is totally all right to put nutmeg and mace in the recipe. It's very 18th century for these omelet recipes to have that in it. This particular one didn't, so I didn't put it in here. Maybe while you're not looking, I put some in, but uh, let's, let's find out what these tasted like. Mm. This is a really, really good combination. Um, asparagus by itself can be a little too much sometimes um, and be bitter or have different kind of flavors that I don't necessarily care for. This mixed in with the eggs with these spices and of course topped off with toast makes sort of like the perfect combination. Now I would probably add a little mushroom ketchup, but that's just me. A little bit of mace would, or, or nutmeg would be a wonderful combination, but as it stands, this is a great combination 
uh, and for, actually one, one of the best. So it would make a wonderful breakfast, but I'm not sure that it was ne this was necessarily just a breakfast dish in the 18th century. Uh, this likely might have shown up at the table at any of the standard meals. So a perfect 18th century, especially late 18th century combo uh, for English cooking, and it likely would have shown up in uh, North America in the very later part of the 18th century and the early 19th century when some of these same kinds of influences show up in North America. So uh, a wonderful combo and asparagus, especially in England, was grown out of season. So this isn't necessarily a, a really, really seasonal dish either. So perfect, perfect 18th century, uh, very tasty recipe.